Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Karsten Prasa, a Johns Hopkins chemist who studies wastewater-based epidemiology, basically what you can learn about communities by testing their poop. This tool was recently used in Arizona to find asymptomatic people with COVID and stop an outbreak before it could start. Let's listen. Carson Prasa, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about, well, actually, I'm not sure how to talk about it. So I want to call it poop. What do you want to call it? Mm, Yeah, it's part of it. Let's call it sewage. Okay, that's good. It's not only poop, there's a bunch of other things in there. (laughs) Great. So we're talking about sewage and COVID. I recently heard that, and I think we've, a lot of us have heard the story that at the University of Arizona, they were testing the sewage from many of their dorms and they found evidence of COVID in the sewage at one dorm and were able to sort of just test the students and faculty and staff in there and found two cases of asymptomatic COVID and were able to quarantine folks and basically stop an outbreak before it could happen, which is fascinating. So I'm curious how that works. And is this something that other places could and should be doing? The way it works is that we excrete virus particles in our poop, basically. And we can detect them by uh, microbiology uh, tools like PCR in the wastewater, basically before it goes, for example, into the wastewater treatment plant. Or in, in the case in Arizona, they probably looked into the sewer line that came out of the dorms individually and, and monitored there for the presence of the virus, uh, at least the, the virus DNA or RNA, one of the two. And is this something you would do regularly or you just sort of pick a point in time to do? Well, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, so actually, originally, this technology, which is called wastewater epidemiology, has been developed in Europe actually for illicit drugs. So people had the idea, can we monitor illicit drug consumption based on wastewater? And that has led to, um, and we can, I mean, if you want, we can talk about this as well, but this has kind of led to more and more people thinking, well, can we actually use our wastewater as a, as a source of information for our community health? And I mean, when you think about illicit drugs, the advantage is obviously that it's non-biased. I mean, in the sense that typically you would ask people for usage consumption, and obviously that might not be very accurate because people are probably under-reporting. So, but yeah, so that has kind of led to more and more uh, research into this area of using actually wastewater to assess the consumption of different things and potentially even community health in general based on, on pharmaceuticals and other things that are present in the wastewater. And the idea, again, so the idea is that we excrete the viruses, we shed virus particles that can then be measured in the wastewater. And as you mentioned, there might be asymptomatic cases, so you might not have actually any symptoms, but you still have the virus in you and you might shed the virus. And then obviously you can still detect it in the wastewater. So when you do this for illicit drugs, I'd like to back up because it's very interesting. Were they doing individual households? I mean, how were they figuring this out? Well, so the way it is typically been done is on the influence uh, of wastewater treatment plants, basically. So you could, you know, the sewer shed, so to say. So what is, where is the wastewater coming from? And then you can basically determine the wastewater that's coming in. And wastewater treatment plants, they monitor their, their influence of the wastewater routinely anyway, because they need to assess, okay, how does their process work? How efficient it is? So they, they take, every day they take samples in the influent and also in the effluent. So you can basically use some of these samples that they are taking to then monitor for the for the drugs. And then based on what we typically know in terms of how much people are consuming, you can then back calculate or at least estimate what the usage is. And I guess on the illicit drug side, one strategy was also to maybe identify what other new drugs coming when, when you think, for example, about fentanyl and, and, other, and other things. But you also pointed out the, the household and that's actually, so I'm personally very critical and skeptical when with the illicit drug aspect, because there is some 
ethical issues that are involved there. Because obviously, if you would go down to the more community scale, like smaller scale, neighborhood scale, you could, for example, point out yeah, specific areas where you have already a high drug usage and things like this. So that could, I think there, there could be some problems there if you just basically point out, okay, these are the neighborhoods where we have all these drugs. And when you think about Baltimore, where we have specific areas, I, don't, I think you could do some damage in the sense that um, you basically just highlight, okay, these are the bad neighborhoods, so to say, in terms of how this is perceived. And actually, in China, they have actually used this to crack down on drug labs. Wow. So they've actually taken it kind of to the more extreme where they looked really into a smaller scale neighborhood to actually identify, are there any drug labs where there's high concentrations of these compounds coming down the sewer, which is an approach of doing that. But again, I mean, I'm not sure how, how people would feel about that if you would do something similar in the US. Sounds like lots of privacy concerns there. Yeah, exactly. So, so back to COVID, we obviously have this highly publicized case in Arizona, but is this being done more widespread? Yeah, this is, I would say at this point, it's mostly, it's almost done globally. I know Australia is working on this. Europe has been working on this and in Switzerland. So there's a lot of research going into this. And I think in terms of saying yes, no, COVID is present or absent, it's definitely good. What we don't know about yet is really, well, how much can we say about how many cases there are, for example? Because there is an issue with people are shedding differently. So not everybody basically sheds the same amount of virus particles. And then also what we don't know yet is, well, how stable is it actually in the sewer system, like in terms of the detection method? So there is a, a qualitative side of things that we can do with it. But the quantitative side, that's definitely something that is still in the development. And I don't know, I'm not sure if we can get there because again, there's a lot of variability in this, in the detection. So what you're saying is that you can tell if it's there, but it's hard to tell sort of how many people might be infected based on what you find in the sewage. Right, exactly. So, I mean, you, in Arizona, again, if you, ha you, you can basically detect, okay, it's, you see, it is, you have a positive detect or you don't, but I think that's at this point at least the extent of what we can say. So that makes it a bit more complex when you think about temporal trends, for example, especially also because wastewater isn't always the same every day in a sense, because you have wastewater coming from houses, but then you also have industry. Or in some areas, you also have what is called combined sewer systems. So basically the rainwater goes into that as well. So you might have dilution effects, for example. And that can obviously lead then to, well, if you have a rain event and you have a combined sewer system, you're the concentration of the virus detects might go down, but that might just be an artifact because of the dilution in the system, not necessarily because the cases go down. So is it easier, for example, in the case of Arizona to test the sewage and then go back and, and test the people in the building? Is that make, I guess that's an easier proposition than testing everyone in the building. Yeah, for sure. Because again, and, yeah. and also, I mean, again, it could be an early warning system because you actually see these virus these detects popping up before people actually have symptoms. So you could actually prevent the spreading under these conditions. Why aren't we seeing more of this then? I guess, I mean, the infrastructure is, might not be necessarily in place. Testing sewage is different than what we do right now, for example, for nasal swabs. There are some uncertainties involved in this. And I mean, again, the good thing about, for example, when you think about university campus, and I actually talked to several universities over the summer who about this too. I mean, if you have kind of a confined campus, you can certainly do that. But I mean, what you have to do is you basically have to go into the manholes and sample the sewage. So I mean, there's a lot of it's it's a lot of work and it's a lot of cost involved that you need to, the people to do that. Yeah. So who's who's basically going to do that? That's then the question. So that's why I think research right now, if research is suited, that's okay. But getting, I don't know, potential utilities involved, just a lot of manpower that they right now at least don't have. How do you see this technology sort of working in the future for COVID or other diseases or other, you know, you mentioned drugs. So I'm, I'm curious, what are the other applications? So I'm a chemist by, tr by training. So I'm coming more from the chemistry side. So I've, my lab at Hopkins does a lot of work on chemicals in the environment. I've done a lot of work on pharmaceuticals, especially because a lot of the things that we take, we excrete. So one aspect that I'm very interested in is, well, Again, when it comes to community health, what can we say based on the detection of specific drugs in our in our wastewater? What people are, yeah, what diseases people have, what they are treated for. Potentially, we could even use it for things like biomarkers of diet, so dietary biomarkers. So, for example, if you eat meat, you excrete certain compounds that might indicate that, or vegetables, for example. 
So you could potentially use this for if you have um, interventions. Like, I mean, Baltimore has a lot of issues, for example, with food deserts. If you would increase the availability of certain foods, you could potentially see this in, in the wastewater by changes over time. So that, and again, the advantage of that it is kind of you're not relying on, on surveys, which tend to be, there's, there's definitely some uncertainty involved in, in, in surveys if you, if you directly ask people. So that's, I think, one of the advantages that could do. And again, I think in, in Australia, for example, I think they're doing at this point a national survey of illicit drugs. So they are basically ramping this up to really, yeah, try to address the illicit drug issues that they have on a broader scale. It's so interesting sort of that this is even possible. I mean, how did we come up with this idea? Well, I mean, my lab, for example, we are very interested in, okay, we have all these chemicals that get into the wastewater. And unfortunately, our wastewater treatment plants, they don't necessarily do a good job in el eliminating them. So they get into the environment. So then we have all these potential adverse effects further down the line. So, and we have now today technology that can detect these compounds at a very high sensitivity with lo very low detection limits. So I, I would say it was kind of a, a natural process. And then in addition, when you think about personalized medicine, for example, I mean, even in medicine, people are going now like monitoring urine for specific biomarkers that indicate certain diseases. And it's kind of like when you think about where does your urine go, it goes into the sewer system. And so, yeah, I think it was kind of like a natural progression in that sense that people thought about, well, why don't we just turn it around and, and think about what, what, how does our community look like further upstream in terms of the health? So, but Again, I mean, I think this is something that we are still at the very beginning of. So, but I, I'm very excited about this aspect of surveillance for the communities. Mm -hmm. And again, we would, it would not be like the sewage at my house. It would be my community sewage. Yeah. I mean, you could, again, you could. So that's what people do right now, mostly the influence of the wastewater treatment systems, because that's, again, the easiest way. But you could potentially go further, let's say, sewage upstream, if you want to say so, to more like, communities, if, but it's definitely, it doesn't make sense on a household level because again, that's too costly and you would, yeah, you could just do that with individual. I could basically just sample your urine and your, your feces to do that. So that's, yeah, that isn't the goal of this. Well, this is really interesting. I had no idea that this existed until I heard about what they were doing at Arizona. And I, I find it fascinating what you're doing at your lab as well. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. <laughs>